Eye Contact, A Mark Manny Mystery, Book 2. Author, Michael Kraft. Publisher, Open Road Integrated Media, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Wednesday, June 23rd. Mark Manning gazes across the expanse of the Chicago Journal City Room, then lowers the newspaper to his lap. This morning's article, repeated from yesterday's late editions, wasn't exactly his best work, certainly not typical of the in-depth investigations that have marked his career and secured his reputation on the city's top journalist. But then, this particular assignment didn't qualify as reporting at all. Not in his book. Yesterday afternoon, the paper's managing editor, Gordon Smith, nabbed Manning in the hallway and thrust a copy of a one-page press release into his hand, telling him, Cobble something together for the next edition. This might be big, and we've got squat. Manning skimmed a couple of paragraphs, something about an astronomical discovery. He asked Smith, Shouldn't this go to Cliff Nolan? Referring to the journal's science editor. It did. Marco. Nolan was supposed to interview this Zarnak character and write up the discovery in layman's terms, but he never delivered. Smith was already backing away from Manning, taking a turn down another aisle. I'm late for the daily editorial meeting, he explained. Uh, just piece something together and get it into the system. We need to have something in ink or we'll be playing catch up to the post. What happened to Cliff? asked Manning. But Smith was already rushing away toward his meeting, so Manning got to work even though he was more than qualified to rewrite a press release for print. He still felt qualms about putting his byline on a science story that was out of his realm and, to his way of thinking, not very interesting. There was nothing in this claimed discovery that roused his curiosity, other than the skepticism of Zarnak's peers, which might well be dismissed as professional jealousy. There was no conflict in this story. Manny would simply relay the known facts like some talking head TV anchorman. Grousing, he told himself, this story has no element of mystery, does it? Now he leans back in his chair, folds the paper, and sets it squarely on his clutter-free desk, which accommodates only the essential telephone, appointment book, steno pads, pencil mug, and a framed photo of a handsome man of 33 who stares at the reporter with a fixed, worshipping smile. Half walls surround the desk on three sides, demarcating the limits of Manning's workspace. A babble of organized confusion intensified by an approaching deadline fills the vast room, but he does not hear it. Immersed in thoughts about a promising story, he's eager to begin drafting. There's a ghost payroll scandal at the local water utility that's about to burst wide open right for a round of investigative journalism. He switches on his computer terminal and begins transcribing notes, originally written as always in the blue-black ink of an antique Mont Blanc. His pet fountain pen. His right leg pumps autonomically, burning off energy not consumed by the action of his fingers on the keyboard. The heel of his spit-polished cardigan shoe taps the hard carpeting. A summer weight blazer, only recently brought out of storage, drapes the back of his chair. He stops typing and leans forward to check his words, searching for a tighter phrase. He squints, unsatisfied, and the clean, strong features of his face turn momentarily comical. If a stranger were to glimpse him at work and guess his age, he might be pegged for 30-something, but in fact, he's 42 now. Fit and trim. The waist size of his khaki slacks hasn't changed in years. His eyes, uncommonly green, appear even more so. Their color amplified by the background hue glowing from the screen. Finding his phrase, he resumes typing, then uncaps his pen and checks off several items on a page of his steno book. Say, Mark, got a minute? Manning swivels from his computer to find Gordon Smith standing behind him with a cub reporter. David Bosch, in tow. The eager kid was a newsroom intern from Northwestern until a year ago, when he finished his journalism degree and was kept on full-time. His broad shoulders and owlish glasses give him the air of a boyish Clark Kent. 
a likeness that has not escaped Manny, who has taken care to keep their chummy relationship strictly professional. Uh, of course, Gordon, Manning answers while standing. Uh, what's up? As a casual aside, he adds, uh, Hi, Dave. A few minutes ago, the editor says, I got a call from Nathan Kane. Hmm, asks Manning, a hint of caution coloring his voice. A phone call from the journal's legendary publisher may be an everyday occurrence for Gordon Smith, but others in the newsroom rarely see the man, let alone speak to him. As the result of this call from him on high, Smith is now standing at Manning's desk. And... Smith laughs, scratching the back of his head. It's the uh, damnedest thing, Marco, but Nathan was really knocked out by your Zarnak piece this morning. He told me to keep you on the story, and uh, he wants to make a splash with a page one follow-up on Sunday. Uh, we'll be promoting it for the rest of the week, um, broadcast and print. Manning opens his mouth to protest, intending to tell his editor that the story was nothing, a rehash of a press release. If Kane wants it taken further, Cliff Nolan is clearly the best writer for the job. Besides, Manning is itchy to get started on that Waterworld story. But before Manning can voice the first syllable, Smith tells him, I know how you feel about it, and between you and me, I agree, but... Nathan gave a direct order, and I'm not inclined to tell him he's wrong. Again, Smith chuckles his customary technique for dispelling tension. It's just a couple of days' work. Uh, then you can get back to whatever steamy expose you're cooking up. And to sweeten this story, uh, Nathan suggested that I assign you an assistant. Peering over Smith's shoulder, David Bosch waggles the fingers of one hand as if to say, That's me! Lord Manning tells himself, all I need. If there's no way to get out of this nowhere story, I'd rather work it alone. But now we're going to turn it into a learning experience for some rookie. Resigned to the inevitable, he forces a smile and tells Smith, Okay, Gordon, uh, we'll have it wrapped up within 48 hours. That's a boy, Marco, beaming Smith. Pats Manning's back, then strides off toward the city desk, leaving the cadences of yet another chuckle in his wake. Manning shakes his head and sits. David steps into the cubicle, telling him, Sorry, Mark. I know you've got better things to do. The whole setup sounds goofy to me, too. But the truth is, I'll be honored to work with the best in the business. There now, Manning thinks this may not be so terrible after all. In spite of the kid's limited reporting experience, he's already a pro at pushing the right buttons. And he's certainly not hard on the eyes. Manning gestures that David should sit, telling him, Actually, I'm a bit rusty at team reporting, so it may turn out that you're just along for the ride. You're the boss, David assures him, and I'll try to keep out of your way. As he perches on the edge of the desk, Manning can't help but notice the long, knotted muscles of David's thighs. He's clearly invested some time at the gym. And I'll try to make you feel useful, Manning tells him, glimpsing at his desk calendar. He asks, uh, Is your schedule open this afternoon? Now it is. Uh, let me give Zarnak a call and see if he has time for us to visit him later. He pulls a file from a drawer, retrieves Zarnak's original press release, and makes note of a phone number, telling David, in all honesty... I shouldn't grumble about this was Celebration 2000 set to open in less than two weeks. We're both lucky not to be writing sidebars for the art section. With a laugh, David nudges his glasses, which have crept down his nose. That's exactly what I was doing five minutes ago when Mr. Smith rescued me. I know the festival is a big deal and all. It seems the whole world is pouring into the city these days. And I think it's been blown way out of proportion. Tell me, Manning flumps back in his chair, eyeing the framed picture on his desk. I have more than a passing interest in seeing this festival up and running, indicating the photo, he asked. Uh, you know Neil Waite, don't you? Uh, my, uh, well, loft mate? Not that Manny would ever deny his relationship with Neil. These have been the happiest, most liberating two years of his life. I bet he just doesn't care for the term lover, finding it entirely too earthy for most contexts. 
The language is full of other descriptors. Roommate, companion, partner, husband, friend. All of them borrowed from other settings. None of them lamat just. Loft mate will suffice. I'm sure, answers David. You introduced us when he dropped by the office one day. He seems like a great guy, an architect, right? Right. And that's what got Neil involved with the festival. He's really got his hands full with the architecture committee. So involved that most of his building projects have been backburnered till after the 4th. And now he's tied up with another committee that's planning the Human Rights Conference. David hesitates uncomfortable with the topic. That's like gay rights, right? Manning stands. It sure is. He closes our next folder and it's got a lot of people upset. The Christian Family Crusade wasted no time announcing they'd stage a counter-demonstration at the opening. David stands to look Manning in the eye. Don't mind them. They're just a bunch of crazies. Manning exhales an odd noise, something between a sigh and a laugh. That's what makes me nervous. From the aisle, a little teen voice interrupts their discussion. Here you go, darling. A fresh supply of bedside reading. Into the cubicle, sidles Daryl. A gay black copy kid, still a student at Northwestern who has never made a secret of his general interest in men, or his particular interest in Manning. He carries a hefty stack of oversized books, foxed and musty smelling, just plucked from the reference section of the paper's morgue. He nudges between the two reporters. Excuse me, David. And drops the books onto the desk with a dusty thud. Manning looks askance at Daryl. What's this? A basic astronomy, hon. Time to brush up on the cosmos. How'd you know? Daryl's gaze glides first over one shoulder, then the other. Coyly, he responds. My ears to the rail. Manning flips through the titles, recognizing that Daryl has chosen well. I suppose I should thank you for your efficiency. Daryl purses his lips, cooing. You owe me one, Mark? David smirks at the comment, but Manny lifts it past, picking one of the books from the pile, a thin primer of astronomical theory and vocabulary. He hands it to David, telling his new assistant, uh, Spend some time with this over lunch. It'll be helpful. Background if we get to meet Zarnak this afternoon. David tucks the little book under one arm. Will do, sir, he tells Manny, cuffing him on the shoulder with his massive fist. A playful gesture, typical of his jock-friendly manner. Then he turns and leaves the cubicle, heading toward his own desk at the far side of the newsroom. Uh-huh, uh -huh, croaks Daryl. Remember, gorgeous, you're married. Manning sits. What's that supposed to mean? I saw you watching David's sweet derriere strutting down the aisle. He plants himself on the edge of Manning's desk and looks down at the reporter with an accusing grin. If you're entertaining a dip in the company inkwell, I've got first dibs. Christ, Daryl, there's no harm in looking. I confess you caught me. David's an eyeful, but he's off limits. I'm happily coupled, and he's happily straight. <laughs> Daryl's reaction is so explosive that it briefly quells the surrounding hubbub. He leads into Manning's face to say, that four-eyed muscle boy may look like a big butch stud, but I'm telling you, honey, when the lights go out, his feet hit the ceiling. Manning's blank stare conveys disbelief. It's true, Daryl assures him. We were in school together. Not that I've had the pleasure, mind you, but I know plenty of others who have. I had no idea, says Manning. He's worked here almost two years. He's a closet case? Mark, or could it be more charitable to call him guarded? Daryl's tone turns confidential. In any event, if you're interested, he's makeable. Manning laughs at the idea of pointing out, I'm old enough to be his father. Daryl tells him, He's 24, you're 42. That would make you one very young, very attractive daddy. Get off it. He'd never be interested in me. I happen to know otherwise, Daryl gives him a lascivious wink. Besides, Manning's voice rises, a register. I'm not available. Mm-hmm, says Daryl, sounding unconvinced. 
Now hold on, says Manning, dead serious, needing to sort this out. Neil and I are committed to each other. I changed my whole lifestyle, my very self-identity, in order to build a life, a home, with him. And he moved cross-country, walked away from an established career in Phoenix, in order to be here with me. We love each other, Daryl. We're happy. Why would I jeopardize that? Equally serious, Daryl tells him, Because you're human, Mark. You're a man. You're curious. Neil brought you out, God bless him, and I could see why you were rolled over, but that was two years ago, and you've never played the field. Neil has. Before I came along, sure. Sure, insinuation hangs in the air. They eye each other wearily for a few long seconds, then as if responding to some unspoken signal, they each break the stare. They have often sparred like this, though always over trivial matters. Office chat. Daryl has never strayed into such intimate territory, and he has gone too far. Sorry, he says, removing his butt from Manning's desk. I ought to keep my yap shut. You and Neil are great together. Keep it that way. Manning smiles. Coming Saturday night, he and Neil have just finished an extensive renovation of their loft on the city's near north side, and they've invited Daryl to a housewarming party. Sheepishly, he answers, If I'm still welcome? Of course, Manning assures him. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get hold of Dr. Pabo Zarnak. As Daryl turns to leave the reporter alone with his work, Manny mutters into the messy pile of books strewn on his desk. I still think Cliff Nolan would be a better choice for this assignment. He probably would be, Daryl turns back, if we could find him. Manny looks up. What? Smith expected him to interview Sarnak and file his story by Monday night, but he didn't. Then Tuesday, yesterday, he didn't show up at all, so Smith reassigned the story to you. And this morning, asks Manning, guessing the answer, Dale shrudges. Still no Cliffy Poo. Smith told me to start phoning his apartment every hour, but I haven't been able to reach him. Manning wrings his brows. Clifford Nolan is a dedicated, intelligent writer with a partridge prize to prove it. Manning has always admired the man's refined taste and astute mind. He's at least 50 now and not much fun. But he's certainly dependable, and it's not like him to fail on a story. Even so, Manny considers Cliff is still single with an adolescent appetite for women, and though he rarely drinks, when he does, he binges. Manny has seen him out of control at a party or two, so the unexplained absence may not be such a mystery after all. Manny tells Daryl, When you hear from Cliff, let me know. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.